is everywhere apparently powerless, resist in hidden surreptitious ways uh, the powers that surround them. And Jim argued very provocatively, I mean, I think this is partly a question of intellectual generations or political generations, but he argued very provocatively that actually if you add up all these small, daily, mundane forms of resistance, they improve the lives of poor rural people more than these occasional kind of headline revolutions and rebellions and so on. And then at the end of that chapter I said, is it useful to replace a one-sided emphasis on the interests and pre presumed omnipotence of capital with a similarly one-sided narrative of resistance on various scales from the heroic to the mundane? And of course when an academic formulates a question like that, the answer is already given in the way the question is formulated. I think, no, it's not useful to kind of say, replace the idea that it's all exploitation by an all-powerful capital with the idea that, no, it's all resistance of different kinds by virtually everyone all the time. And then I say something at the end of that chapter about land reforms because it's a very, very large, complex subject, but uh, and one on which, uh, how, to which Harun has contributed a, a lot in terms of our literature and our understanding. But I, I usually just mention land reforms, which have been important from the French Revolution onwards, to say land reforms provide a further example of how important political dynamics can be in the persistence of small-scale farming and capitalism. Um, and I also try to make it clear that the economic rationale of land reform from above, from the World Bank, from USAID, from northern governments, is usually to establish small farmers as viable commodity producers, as entrepreneurs who are competitive and can hold their own in markets. And then the issue of who benefits from land reforms, very, very important issue in both class and gender terms, connects with the questions about class formation among farmers that I address in the next chapter. So chapter seven is called Class Formation in the Countryside. And some of my friends, comrades said, oh great, chapter seven, he's finally got to class formation in the countryside. But the point is, of course, in the previous chapters, I'm trying to establish a foundation for expressing that, for explaining it, uh, and arguing for it, rather than just asserting it. Um, and the questions there are, well, do family farmers in the South, peasants, small farmers, do they constitute a social class, as many populists assert or assume? You know this expression, people of the land? Well, it's a very common concept these days, and a very strong populist concept. It's basically saying that nearly all farmers in the world, whether they're in Manitoba or whether they're in Mali, have certain interests, certain things in common. And it's an idea that I take on, particularly in this chapter 7, and try to take apart, if you like, I nearly said deconstruct, but I didn't say deconstruct, <laughs> to say, what is going on here? What, when, when people are arguing for people of the land, and they, they do believe that that includes everything from grain farmers in Manitoba to small cotton farmers in Mali, what, what, what is involved in using that concept? What does it mean? And I then provide a theoretical explanation which I've developed in my work that many so-called small farmers are actually petty commodity producers. If they are successful petty commodity producers, then they can reproduce themselves through their farming activity. But I also suggest and this again is controversial, but it's part of the fun, that 
many, many people in the South who are called small farmers are actually members of classes of labor. They live mostly by selling their labor power. Marx is kind of, you know, sn snapshot definition of a proletarian. They may do some farming, but they cannot reproduce themselves through farming. They might not be dispossessed of all of land or other means of production, but they don't command enough in order to, to reproduce themselves. And I think this is really extremely important. And something that <clears throat> is interesting to me, and, and Haroon would know about, and perhaps some of the other <coughs> teachers here, is that some of us Marxists were saying this for years and years and years, Finally, it seems to be accepted by IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, by the World Bank, if you read their 2008 World Development Report on Agriculture. They are now accepting the same thing. In the World Development Report for 2008, there's a table on the proportion of rural population in different regions of the world who reproduce themselves primarily from their own farming. There is only one region in which that is more than 50%. So when someone as entertaining as Samir Amin says there are 3 billion peasants in the south, I wouldn't take that very seriously. Because 3 billion in that figure is like everybody who has been near the countryside. There's not people who are farming and who are farming as their primarily as their primary means of livelihood, who are able to reproduce themselves primarily through their own farming. So what I do in this chapter is to say, well, those who are successful small farmers, and good luck to them, they are actually successful small farmers because they're successful petty commodity producers. They can produce for markets, they can handle the stresses of reproducing themselves as both labor and as capital. That's what petty commodity production means. But there are far more people in the south, in the rural areas, or we should say, to be more accurate, in the rural areas some of the time, but not all of the time, who are members of what I call classes of labor, who uh, reproduce themselves primarily through uh, selling their labor power in one form or another. And the great ethnographer of that is Jan Bremen, who's written a series of stunning studies of India and has come up with this concept of footloose labor. A lot of so-called Small farmers are actually footloose labor. Yes, in the village, part of the year, trying to plant a crop or trying to bring in a crop or on labor migration and trying to get their wives and daughters and so on to, to do the farming because they have to. So it's also strongly gendered like uh, everything else. So the point of this chapter is to say, yes, there's a lot of diversity but because somebody does some farming, some of the time, we shouldn't consider them a peasant or a small farmer in any very full-blown, uh, full strong sense. And we need to look at how they reproduce themselves much more carefully. My last word on family farmers. Again, this is a test. Students, it's a simple test. You, you, you can apply yourselves if you're reading about this. When you see the term family farmers, ask yourselves, does this mean family-owned farms or family-managed farms or family-worked farms? 